Well, good morning and welcome everyone. It's good to be back with all of you. Uh, I've had multiple people ask me about this golden ratio homework question. Um, and I think I'm gonna have to go take a look at that one after class and maybe put together a little video on that um, if none of you have already done so. Um, I think that you probably are all thoroughly sick of working through multiple integrals, triple integrals, quadruple integrals, five upple integrals. Like they just, they're not hard, but the questions are so long. There's so many spaces and places where you can make an arithmetic or algebra uh, mistake. Um, so I think that it really is time for a break. So really good news. We're gonna take a three week long uh, hiatus from different from mostly from derivatives and from integrals. And we're going to talk about infinite series. I call this the infinite break. Uh, and it's gonna to begin today, tomorrow, talking about the concept of a sequence, which is basically a function um, where the domain is the positive integers. And then from, from there, beginning next week, we will talk about infinite series short version, we add up an infinite number of items and see what we get. Hey, Dusty, so Go ahead. I have one question for you. So do we need to know like every topics from Cal 3? Because uh, the, these topics were the last one. And you know, in the, in the last like a week, there was a mess, everything was messed up because of COVID. So we like, especially in our class, like we are, we are not that Proper, we are not that good in the last in, in series because that, that was the last topic and the, that, week, that week was messed up. And even there was no exams on that one because everyone chose to get the, the best, like the previous course. Mm -hmm. um, so your question is, do you have to understand the stuff about power series and Taylor series in order to understand what we're about to do with yeah. infinite series? Oh, yeah. Exactly, yeah. No. Yeah, that's thanks. the short answer. Yeah. This, this material is actually prerequisite to the stuff that you already learned. So I hope that as we go through all of this material, it will help you understand why you were doing what you were doing in, those, mm -hmm. in that last week. Uh, but but there is no expectation that you understand or remember those, series, those sections. If you do, it will help you. It'll help you understand why we're doing what we're doing and where it's going but it's not required. Mm -hmm. Good okay, question. Thanks. So very good. So let's switch gears. So we are in, we are about to begin a new chapter. We're going to talk about sequences and series. Short version, a sequence is a list, like a list of numbers. And a series uh, is what happens when you add all those numbers up. And so we talk about an infinite sequence because there's an infinite item, number of items on our list. And an infinite series is when you add up an infinite number of things. We're gonna talk a lot about uh, two terms. We're gonna talk about divergence. Divergence is when whatever that list is or sum is goes, does not approach a single number. Convergence is when all of those things come together and approach a single number. So let's look at the notes. Very good. All right. So we are starting sections 10.1 and 10.2. 10.1 is sort of an introduction and 10.2 is about sequences specifically. And I've sort of blurred them into a single section. So let's begin with an introduction. So a sequence can be thought of as a list of numbers written in a definite order. Uh, they usually are described using subscripts. So A1 would be the first number, A2 would be the second, A3, A4, et cetera, et cetera. The three dots basically mean continue in the same manner. Uh, 
Then uh, the AN, this is what's called the general term. Uh, the general or the nth term. And so sometimes you'll say, you might say, well, what is AN? Well, what is N? Well, it's just, it's sort of like saying uh, F of X. So you, we have AN in this section. Before this, we used to have F of X, but F of X was so yesterday. So now it's AN. They're kind of an kind of analogous. So the number A1 is called the first term, A2 is the second term, and in general AN is the nth term. We're going to deal exclusively with infinite sequences, and so each term AN will have a successor AN plus one. So you're always just adding one to that subscript, going from N to N plus one. Notice that for every positive integer N, there's a corresponding number AN, and so a sequence can be defined as a function whose domain is the set of positive numbers. But we usually write a n instead of the function notation f of n for the value of a function at the number n. So think about it this way. If you want to write a n, that's one, two, three, four characters. If you want to write a n like that, it's only two characters. So it's more efficient to write it this way, but it means the same thing as f of n. Uh, we can describe uh, notationally a sequence multiple ways. So we could describe it using the curly brackets around the outside. And notice that we again have the three dots. So a1, a2, a3, dot, 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 continue on in that manner. We could write it with just the a n term, the general term in there, inside the curly brackets. Or if we wanted to be a little bit more precise, we could write it with the curly brackets, and then we could say, here's where our ends start, and here's where our ends go to. It's like the starting n and the ending n, that being infinity. Any of these notations would be okay. If you were on a homework or an assessment question and doing a presentation, I would accept any of these notations. They all mean the same thing. Are there any questions yet? Very good. So when a n is given by a formula, we refer to it as the general term of a sequence. And so there's two types of sequences we're going to focus in, in, in on in this section. We're going to talk about arithmetic sequences, and we're going to talk about geometric sequences. Spoiler, arithmetic sequences are like linear functions. like the old ones without, with a slope and a y-intercept. And then geometric sequences are like uh, exponential functions. In terms of formulas, the, the key vocab here is that with an arithmetic sequence, we have what's called a common difference. Common difference. Um, this common difference, that's like code for slope. And then if you're in a geometric sequence, there's what's called a common ratio, R. And that's like code for the base of the exponential. And we'll see more about that in, in a moment. So let me switch over to the doc cam and start working through some of these examples. Well, actually, before I work examples, are there any questions? Very good. All right.
My little buddy. Oh, that should work. So in this first example, what you probably notice right away is that each time we go from two to five, we go by plus three. And five to eight, we go to plus three. And so we could, we can see that the slope is three, except for slope is so yesterday. So we don't call this the slope anymore. Now we call it the common difference. And that would be D equals three. We want to know what A1 is. So remember, A1 would simply be the first entry on the list. And so the first entry on the list would be 2. We want to know the fourth entry in the sequence. So that would be A4. That would be the next entry. And so we could just add 3 to this 8, and we get 11. The last part, D, asks for the 20th term in the sequence. And if we want the 20th term in the sequence, we could use this formula that says that AN is equal to A1 plus D times N minus 1. In our case, A1 is 2, D is 3 times N minus 1. And let's just check before we get too carried away. If we let uh, n equal 1, so here's n equals 1, we would have 2 plus 3 times 0, which would be 2. Yay. If we let n equal 2, 2 plus 3 times 1, or 5. Yay. That works. So if we wanted to find a20, we would have 2 plus 3 times 19, which is a funny way of writing. 59. Questions about this? Very good. So let's look at another example, this time of a geometric sequence. So if you want to find R in a geometric sequence, what you want to do is divide, uh, you want to divide consecutive entries. So if I looked at these first two entries, I would have 6 divided by 3, and that is 2. If I looked at tw the entries 2 and 3, I'd have 12 divided by 6, which is again equal to two. Notice that you have the same number in both cases, or same number, i.e. a common number. And how did we find that number? We did division or we found the ratio. And so here we would say that the common ratio R equals two. Our formula for that would be R is equal to A N plus one divided by A N. Divide consecutive terms. B asks for A1. A1 is again the very first term, so that would be three. C asks for the fourth term, and so to find the fourth term, we go to the third term, and then we would multiply by 2, which would be the common ratio, and get 24. In D, we want to find the 20th term of the sequence, and so we use the formula that for a geometric sequence, an equals a1 
times r to the n minus 1. In our case, this would be 3 times 2 to the n minus 1. Let's just check. So if we put in n equals 1, this would be 3 times 2 to the 0, or 3. 6 is n equals 2. 3 times 2 to the 1 is 6. Yep, seems like it's working. So a to the 20th would equal 3 times 2 to the 19th, which is equal to a big number. Are there any questions about this? Why is it r to the n minus 1? Where did that part come from? <laughs> um, good question. I think maybe in both cases it can be a little bit easier to just see what's happening. So if we have, um, if we started with a1, and then the next term, a2, would equal a1 times r. a3 would equal a1 times r times r again. a4 would equal a1 times r cubed. And in each case, the term is one after the power of the r. Does that make sense? So this is for geometric. If you were in arithmetic, you start with a1, and then you have a2 is equal to a1 plus the common difference. A3 is equal to A1 plus two common differences. A4 is equal to A1 plus three common differences. And again, you see that we're going one less common differences than the subscript. And the reason is because in both cases, because that first term doesn't require any powers of R or any common differences. Did that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Welcome, good question. Any other questions before we go on? Yeah, Dusty, can I see that page one more time, that last one, just for a brief uh, second? This one? Yeah, that one, just give a sec. Yeah. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Very good. So the next question, example three, asks us to do two things. It asks us to identify which type of sequence we have in each case, and then also find the next term. So our answer is going to be either arithmetic and geometric, and then we're going to find the fourth term, fourth term, fourth term, fifth, fifth, et cetera. And so what I'd like to point, you, you cannot identify the type of sequence from two numbers. You need at least three numbers in order to do this. And so in this first case, what's the pattern as we go from one to three and then same pattern going from three to five? Common difference. Common difference, and what's the Up common two. difference? Yeah, so we're Up going two. plus two, plus two. So we would say there's a common difference equal to two. So which kind of sequence is this, arithmetic or geometric? Arithmetic. So this one's arithmetic. And so the next term would be what? Seven. Seven. Yay for seven. Does the blue pen work? Is that legible for everyone? Yes. Okay. In the next term, it, in, the, in the blue there, we were adding two each time. 
in the pink, first time we go up by two, the next time we go up by four, what are we doing each time? We are... Common ratio of two. Common yeah. ratio, we're multiplying by two. Multiply by two. And so in this case, it would be geometric. And your common ratio would be two. What's the next term? 16. 16. Thank you. In uh, example C, 3C, what are we doing from term to term? First time we go down by three, next time we go down by one and a half. Dividing by two. Dividing by two, our only options are adding and multiplying. Multiplying by a half. <laughs> nice. Multiply by a half. Multiply by a half. So this makes it which kind of sequence? Geo. It's geo. R is a half. And the next term would be three quarters. Okay. Example D. What are we doing each time? Adding negative five. Adding negative five, yeah. Plus negative five, plus negative five, plus negative five. So this one is also arithmetic. Your common difference is negative five, and the next term would be negative eight. In E, what are we doing each time? Multiplying by negative 10. Multiply by negative 10. Should we just do an entire assessment that's about these? This, would that be good? Yes. <laughs> okay, nice. I'd be okay with that. Yeah, okay. I'll, we'll, we'll see about that. Um, and so then the next term, so this is gonna be geometric common ratio is negative 10, and the next term would be positive 30,000. Something like that. Questions about this? Uh, hey, Dusty. Go ahead. Uh, I'm looking at your note right now. It's similar. Like you make uh, some mistake on it. I wouldn't be surprised. Yes, um, so which one? Just, which one do I need to look at? So A and C. Well, that's kind of sad. Okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll make a note. Okay, Thank you okay. for that. And I appreciate that. Anything else? Very good. All right. So, so far we've been given a list and now we got to do something that is um, a little bit, uh, it's going to make you think a little bit harder. So we're going to start looking at for what's called the general term. So at the end of our question, when you see this thing where it says you want a general term, at the end, we're going to have something like a n equals blah. That's what our answer is going to look like. So the, in order to figure out what our formula is for a n, the first thing we need to do is identify what kind of formula we are working with. And so I want to start by asking what's the what's the pattern here? Plus one fourth. So we're going plus a fourth each time. So since we're adding plus a fourth each time, what kind of sequence is this? Arithmetic. Thanks. What's the if it's arithmetic, then we need two things. We need the common difference which in this case would be the plus one fourth. And we also need the first term, which is also a fourth, just coincidentally. And so from here, we can use the formula that we were given earlier, and we can say a n is going to be one over four plus one over four times n minus one. Those two uh, one over fours might look um, 
They might look the same, but they're not coming from the same place. The first one is here. And the second, the common ratio, is coming from there. Uh, you might ask, can I simplify this? Could I just write 1 over 4n? Sure. I mean, if you want to just write n over 4, more power to you. But the advantage of writing it in this form is it just simply reminds us that we have an arithmetic sequence. Here's the first term. Here's the common ratio or common difference. Just kind of keeps it clean. Either, either form is, is OK. Questions about this? Very good. The next question, um, and so the notes say, how else can you present this sequence? Well, you could also pre present it as n over 4 and recognize that all it is is a, it's a line. It's a linear function. The catch is, is that if you compare f of x equals x over 4 with a n equals n over 4, what's the difference between the two of these? Like what's the what's the thing you have to remember is the difference? Isn't uh isn't that like um like it's a function that can be graphed or something like that? We we could actually the graph first one. Go ahead, Jay. The the first one is uh, the variable is x, and the second one is a function, but the variable is n. So it's like a spelling issue. Yeah, like change um, it. It's a little question. bit more than that, Enrique. Can we have like n equal to one point five, or do n's have to be integers? Like n's whole? n's have to be integers. Then that, and, and I think that's the difference. The difference has to do with domain. That the domain by default of an f in f of x is any x where that can possibly be defined. Whereas with a sequence, our default domain is positive integers. Um, and this, that's going to come up maybe to, at the end of class today, but definitely it'll, it'll become a little bit of an issue tomorrow. Okay. Very good. This next example is simply asking us to um, is simply asking us to understand the notation. And so I, I want to point out a couple of interesting things. Notice that in this particular example, we are not starting at n equals 1. We're starting at n equals 3. So our very first term would be a3, and that would be negative 1 to the third root 3. a4 would be negative 1 to the fourth, root four, a five equals negative one to the fifth, root five. Yes, you can simplify. But I have a little bit of a cautionary note. Um, I think most of you played with power series uh, and um, in Calc 3, and one of the challenges um, when you're working with a, these infinite lists is that you have to figure out what a general term looks like. Uh, that, it frankly, can be a bit of a, a bear. And when you do these simplifications, it oftentimes can be, uh, it can be hard to see what's going on. So for example, you can see the signs changing. That part's pretty easy. But the pattern that goes square root 3, 2, square root 5, is harder to recognize than the pattern that goes square root 3, square root 4, square root 5. So in general, in this particular case, I would say the rule of thumb is don't simplify until the end. It's like a pro tip. Simplify.
All right. Not all sequences um, have a really nice, clean, simple formula. Some of them do. Um, but for example, imagine that you had the digits of pi, right? So if you have three, one, four, one, five, uh, nine, one, five, nine, two, six. I don't remember what comes after that. And imagine that we had a sequence here, right? We, the, it's trying to figure out what the next digit is. Isn't that difficult? You just go out and figure out what's the next digit of pi. But there isn't a clean formula. This certainly isn't arithmetic or geometric. Uh, and every now and then you'll see in the news, oh, they discovered, you know, the next thousand digits of pi or something like that, um, because there isn't a nice clean formula. So not all sequences have a formula. In this class, we're pretty much going to focus exclusively on sequences where there is a formula. That said, there are two main types of formulas that that we look at. We look at explicit formulas and we look at recursive formulas. Uh, let me see if I can give you uh, like a real life version of each of these. So have you ever, sometimes you're looking for something in your house, maybe you're looking for the cold cereal to eat for breakfast, and you're like, oh, I need cold cereal for breakfast, and you go straight to the cupboard where the, where the cereal is, because you know exactly where it is, you know the exact formula, if you will, for finding the cold cereal for breakfast. And so this, um, an explicit formula lets you go straight to your destination. Find the nth term directly. Other times, um, there are what are called recursive formulas. So in this case, imagine that you're giving someone directions to your house and you say something like, uh, okay, so come out of the school parking lot, um, go on to 240th, go up the hill at the at the stoplight, turn right, uh, go down, uh, follow Pack Highway uh, south for a bit, take a left at the first stoplight, a right at the first intersection, take a left at the second stop sign, take a right at the first stop sign you get out to after that, and then my house is like the third house or fourth house on the left, gray house, um, lots of cars in the driveway. Those kind of, that's a recursive formula uh, because in order for all those rights and lefts and straights and things to make sense, you have to know where you were at the previous direction. Um, and so, uh, so for recursive formula, it's always dependent on the previous term. There, you, generally speaking, it's usually easier to understand a recursive formula and harder to use it. Explicit formulas are usually e harder to understand but easier to use. So let's, let's look at a famous example. So do you see, um, this is the Fibonacci sequence um, that sort of, sort of kind of came up in your homework last night, um, at least indirectly. So what's the pattern? One, one, two, three, five, eight, thirteen. What's going on each time? Um, adding the previous number. A to the n plus one equals a to the n plus a to the n minus one. Yeah. So if we looked at the five or the eight, the eight would be the sum of the three and the five. So three plus five equals eight. If we looked at, if we wanted to find the 13, you would add the previous two terms, five and eight. So what's the next, what are the next couple of terms? We'd have 
8 plus 13 is 21. 21. And then 13 plus 21 is 34, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so there is a recursive formula for this. So a recursive formula, we would say F1 equals one. I'm using F because it's the Fibonacci sequence. So the first Fibonacci number is one. The second Fibonacci number is also one. That's the one and one. And then after that, I say that Fn would be the sum of the previous two. Fn minus one plus Fn minus two. This is for n equal to three, four, five, et cetera, et cetera. This is a recursive formula. It's not that difficult to understand. It says start with these two, and then after that, just add two entries to find the next one out. You might say, well, Dust, is there an explicit formula? Yeah, I think there's actually probably more than one, um, but one that I have that I that I know of comes out of linear algebra, and so we would say that f n equals one over square root of five times one plus root five over two to the n minus one minus root five over two to the n, like that. Holy shnikes. Let's, let's see, what the heck is all this all about? Well, this recursive formula is easy to understand, or it's supposed to be easy to understand. Um, you add a couple, you have a couple terms given, find the next one by adding terms out. But what if I wanted to find the 500th Fibonacci number? So if I wanted to five, find the 500th Fibonacci number, in order to do that, I need to know the 498th and 499th. But in order to find the 499th, I needed the 497th and 498th. And in order to find the 498th, I needed the 496th and 497th. So it's easy to understand what to do, but it's a pain to actually implement this top formula uh, because you have to find the first 499 Fibonacci number just in order to get it, in order to find the 500th one. On the other hand, this explicit formula is quite ugly. Um, and I don't think it's, there's anything obvious about, about the formula. And yet it would have no trouble calculating the 500th entry. You just put a 500 in for the various ends and boom, evaluate it and you'd be able to get your, get your value at the other end. Questions so far about the Fibonacci sequence? Very good. So one thing that I want to point out in this formula below. Dusty, I, I do have one thing. Go ahead. Uh, can I see that previous page, please? Maybe. I can find it. What was on it? Uh, you were writing about, um, I believe, explicit and, oh, I mean, recursive. Right that one right there. Thank you. That's it. Thank you. So this number right here, one plus square root of five over two, this number that's showing up, this is the golden ratio. So last night you were all getting an earful of earrings um, in your homework and it was all stuff around the golden ratio. That's that same golden ratio. And here it is tied to the, uh, Fibonacci sequence and you so like what in the world does this Fibonacci sequence have to do with earrings that's a pretty strange and mysterious thing uh, 
Secondly, you might say, well, Dust, this is a great explicit formula. How in the world would I ever be able to find that? And I have really good news for all of you that are doing a linear algebra, that you can actually find this formula yourself if you use, um, it's been a while since I've worked through it, but you can find this formula yourself by using the diagonalization of matrices and eigenvalues and eigenvectors, which is a topic that you're going to address toward the end of the quarter. So um, I don't know whether you'll actually work through it in class or if it'll be a homework exercise or whatever, but this formula that looks so magical and mystical at the moment um, is actually one that you can come up with for yourself, which I think is pretty doggone cool. So let's go back to the notes and and just look a little bit more at this Fibonacci sequence and golden ratio thing. So the Fibonacci sequence is defined recursively. Uh, this means that the first one or two terms may be given and that the other terms are found by a pattern applied to the preceding terms. So the sequence arose when the Italian mathematician Fibonacci posed this problem about rabbits breeding. Um, it's kind of this famous thing where, you know, every rabbit has, has babies, but it takes a while for them to mature. And so you get this kind of funny uh, rabbit family tree thing happening. And this is where the, uh, the, the, the actual list comes from. Uh, this particular sequence appears in a surprisingly wide variety of situations, particular, particularly in nature. For instance, the number of spiral arms on a sunflower. Um, I think here you've got a cactus. Uh, these oftentimes turn out to be the numbers from the sequence, even the branches of a tree. Uh, here is the Pascal's triangle. Notice here you've got, let's see if I did this right. Oh, no, this, is, this isn't Pascal's triangle. This is the, um, oh my gosh, that's what happens when you don't uh, think beforehand. It is, it is. Yeah, here's the, number, here's the line of Pascal's triangle right here. One, two, one, right there. Uh, so it's one, 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 two, one, one, three, three, one. So Pascal's triangle. Like, which relates to the binomial theorem. Um, and so if you add up the, the values kind of in this diagonal for fashion, boom, you start getting Fibonacci numbers. Like what in the world does multiplying polynomials have anything to do with Fibonacci numbers? That's crazy. Or here you have a, a golden rectangle and you get this kind of spiraling motion going onto the inside. Uh, the golden rectangle is, uh, you can see in nature, if you look at, for example, kind of a spiral staircase looking down, or a nautilus shell, or even some human ears. Um, for those of you that are trying to distract Terry, uh, or maybe you're in Terry's linear algebra class, ask, to, um, ask her about the golden ratio and beauty, and ask her if there's any part, if she's got any particularly mathematically great features. And she's really funny because she always talks, she'll talk about ears. It'll, it'll make all of you laugh. Uh, and, and so what, what's interesting about this particular example with the Fibonacci sequence is it gives us a relatively easy to visualize uh, mathematical sequence uh, with a whole bunch of crazy, um, crazy, amazing natural applications and connections uh, both in the natural world world and through mathematics um, and it's a good reminder that even though we're spending our time talking about arithmetic sequences or geometric sequences and things that are relatively straightforward um, uh, if it even though we're working on things that are straightforward that it we're just a little bit away from doing something that is so so much cooler uh, than that um, as as Damon said, you could probably find countless episodes of Number File or other uh, TED Talks and things like that around the golden ratio and the Fibonacci sequence with a simple Google search. 
and so even though we're not going to spend more time than than this on it in this class um, it really is one of those beautiful things and I would invite uh, I would invite you to go and just marvel at the crazy your challenges be overcome sequentially and may your blessings be infinitely limitless thanks everyone to for coming today. I look forward to seeing you tomorrow for a more on infinite sequences. Um, but in the meantime, have a wonderful day and I will see you tomorrow. Take care.